it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Talmo Piera, um, who is a Salk Fellow um, at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences in San Diego, California. Um, oh. And uh, Salk does this really cool program. Um, I'm sure at the end you could ask Talmo about it. Um, their fellows are um, early, early entrance into PI land, uh, bypassing a postdoctoral fellowship. So these are really promising graduate students um, who show, uh, you know, an aptitude for early independence. Um, and they are PIs, um, uh, but they do get a lot of extra mentoring, more than uh, a lot of places would do typically for junior faculty. Um, and it's really, uh, the, the Salk Institute's um, goal to get uh, scientists that don't need the extra training of a postdoctoral, full training of a postdoctoral experience um, into PI positions, but still provide them with more support than would be provided otherwise in recognition of, um, you know, having skipped that extra mentoring step. Um, so I'm sure Talmo can answer any questions at the end that you might have about that as well. Yeah, it's for folks who are just can't wait to turn their job into like 80% emailing and writing grants. <laughs> eager to transition to that stage. They, they, they won't hold you back. <laughs> yeah, being a PI isn't all it's cracked up to be sometimes. But um, but uh, so um, that's uh, Talmo's title as a, as a fellow. Um, and Talmo's work is really focused on the development of deep learning computational methods. Um, and he applies that to biological systems and problems. Um, and he's done so in neuroscience during his PhD, uh, which he received his PhD in neuroscience from Princeton. Um, he's also interned uh, at Google AI in perception um, and uh, has won multiple awards uh, as, a, a as a graduate trainee um, for his work. Um, and so he's going to talk to you uh, about the work that his lab does, but more broadly about AI in um, solving biological problems. So Tomo, thank you again for agreeing to talk to the trainees. Thanks so much. Uh, it is my pleasure. Go ahead and just start screen sharing here. And let me just uh, mention that. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat and do please feel free to interrupt, ask questions. We can keep this super casual. So uh, the title of, of today's talk is What is AI for Understanding Brains, Diseases, and Plants? Which is a pretty interesting, pretty broad mix. But really it's something that would only really be possible in somewhere like Salt where you know, we don't have like any departments and we're, we really are able to collaborate across all these different disciplinary boundaries. And I think you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate, you know, why I, I kind of chose to come here and why this place really enables this type of more hybrid and frankly transdisciplinary research program. But um, our objective is just to kind of give you a, uh, uh, an overview of the types of things that, that we do and what we can do with AI still in biology. And so um, I'll try to avoid getting into too much nitty gritty detail, but I'm happy to kind of delve into things as, as you know, if people are, are curious about one topic or the other. Okay, so with no further ado, let's jump in. And essentially we'll start with this observation that you know, across the uh, all forms of biology, whether it's a plant growing through soil, a fruit fly grooming its head, or a giraffe walking through the savanna, all forms of life evolve the ability to move. And in some sense, they evolve to move, not just the ability to. And, you know, putting our evolutionary biologists' hats on, this is something that just makes a lot of sense, right? To move in order to survive, you need to move in order to, re uh, to reproduce and pass on your genes, you need to move in order to find food or get away from, from potential threats. And again, this is true at, at every level of biology. And so, 
it makes sense that evolution would then give rise to systems that allow you to move in, in, in more complex ways, all the way to the point where uh, it led to the, to the development of nervous systems and eventually brains. Um, and so if we do, if we want to understand biology in all its forms, in all its richness, it would behoove us to have a good way to quantify biological movement. But in other words, we go from images and videos that look like this to the distilled out representation of the degrees of freedom afforded by a particular body and morphology, right? Essentially, how can we pull out the key information that, that represents how an animal or plant or, or other, other species can move? And if we can pull that out just from these images, then that means that we have the ability to tap into one of the more fundamental processes and properties of biology. So how do we go about doing this? Uh, I'm going to briefly kind of overview some of the, 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 the levels of how we go about quantifying these types of dynamics, focusing initially on, on animals and, and animal movements. So this can be done at multiple levels. And if, if you guys do any kind of behavioral neuroscience study, you might be familiar with at least some of these. For instance, the most common one being that of centroid tracking, which is essentially converting an image of an animal navigating in space into a single point, a single coordinate within its space, typically from an overhead perspective, that allows you to plot out these trajectories, right? From these trajectories, you can infer all sorts of things like when animals make decisions to, to turn, to uh, interact with an object or another conspecific, or even just have general overall locomotor activity. And that suffices if you're studying navigation. But let's say that we want to look at the brain circuits that correspond to, say, this, this head groovy behavior of a, of a fruit fly. In this case, the center of mass is not changing at all. That trajectory that we have left simply would just would not move at all. In other words, there's no information contained in that one, uh, in that one landmark. At this level, we can get a little bit more detailed and essentially uh, do what's called a pose estimation which is, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but essentially we want to be able to capture the movements of not just a single point, but many points along the, the morphology of the animal. And then finally, at an even finer level, we want to do this with not a single animal, but multiple interacting animals, which would be super important for the study of social behavior. This is a study that is particularly near and dear to my heart, given its uh, evolutionary importance and, and, and conservation across the, uh, the animal kingdom. So how are we going to go about doing this, right? Well, the one of the key focuses of my lab is basically to answer this question, right? How can we quantify these, uh, these types of behaviors, these types of movements, and in particular using a flavor of AI called deep learning. Deep learning really is one of the more popular, or really the, the predominant way to do AI uh, uh, these days. But this did not used to be the case. So well, today what we have on, on the slate is we we'll first talk about some of our seminal work and some of the ongoing new project that we have in the lab uh, regarding quantifying movements. Then I'll talk a little, a little bit about uh, how we've been applying this to the task of, of phenotyping diseases and how we can basically transform this technology to something useful to pull out uh, actual uh, biology. And then uh, yet another vignette on how we do this, not for the purposes of uh, understanding diseases, but rather understanding uh, plants. And this ties into some of our work on, on climate change, which I'll tell you more about once we get to that. So first off, let's just go ahead and start with the first section of the talk on quantifying movement. All right, so I referenced this, this, this term pose estimation, and to be totally clear, what I mean here is we're gonna go from images that look like this, and we wanna be able to predict all of these little coordinates, that all these little colored dots, uh, such that they're overlaid 
into the, onto the corresponding body parts. And the body parts are going to be defined by the experimenter, by whoever is using, or, uh, using the, the, the software, the algorithm, or the tool that can actually achieve the pole estimation, right? And here you can see that we put actual little labels on them, but they don't really need to have a restricted label. The point is that we have a whole bunch of different classes of landmarks, as we call them, that we want to be able to track in these images. And our task is now to have a deep neural network learn how to predict those coordinates from the raw images. So how do we do this? Well, uh, around the time that I was starting my PhD in 2015, um, the deep learning revolution, uh, as it's known, was really kind of taking off. But it took a while until people figured out how to apply it to different tasks, including that of code explanation. But this was around the time when some of these first methods started to come out, demonstrating that, they, that it was possible to use this technology to do what's called markerless motion capture, also known as pose estimation. And what you can see here is that, you know, on the right, we have a visualization of all these, uh, all those these key points that are being tracked, these landmarks that are being tracked, uh, which roughly correspond to what you might get if you ask this, this dancer to wear something like a motion capture suit, which if you've ever watched some, for example, like behind the scenes, or, 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 or VFX, uh, YouTube videos about how people do this in Hollywood. The idea is that in order to do 3D animation for movies like Shrek or Avatar, they, they ask actors to wear these suits that have physical balls placed at all of these locations. But as you can see here, we don't have, we don't have any balls, we don't have any suits, but no what are, what are called markers. And this is this was particularly challenging because it's very hard to write down an algorithm, write down an equation that could actually pull out these coordinates from the images without, you know, uh, it still have it work in, in all sorts of settings, particularly something like this, where it's like a handheld camera, it's a single camera, she's wearing black, it's a black background, decreasing contrast, and all sorts of other issues, right? So how does this work? Okay. Uh, without having to get into how the specific technical background of how deep learning works. It's to say that we start off with a big, what's called convolutional neural network. Doesn't matter the, the specifics there. Think of it as a, uh, uh, essentially a, a function, uh, a programmatic function that can take as input images and it can learn to do all sorts of transformations to that image until it can spit and learn to spit out representation called confidence maps. Okay, when I say it can learn to do this, what I, what I literally mean is that it's learning how to multiply all of this image pixels, all those values that correspond to the colors and the image, uh, and do that in every part of the image, and multiply it out with some equation that it's going to learn, and it's going to apply everywhere in the image. And the way that it learns is by showing it data. We'll get into that in a second. But first, it's representation. This was one of the key breakthroughs that allowed this to work robustly using this, this deep learning technology. And the, uh, simply because this representation was more compatible with the way that neural networks think we will. And so the idea here is that the networks would learn to predict these heat maps effectively, where they would encode uh, the probability that each body part was located in each part of the image. And from those, you could then infer the pose by simply finding the part of the image that had the highest probability. Okay. Uh, really, what, what the magic was here is that these confidence maps essentially give you a little bit of a fudge factor so that you can uh, a reason that the neural networks can learn to reason about related parts of the image that look very similar or that are all uh, close to what uh, each of these landmarks correspond to. In other words, it can learn the context of what it takes to find an ankle, right? That you're likely going to find a shoe, but you're likely going to find a little part of the leg and so on. Okay, so that's cool. If it could work well for humans, then why can't we just apply it to animals? So I thought naively at the beginning of my PhD. Well, as it turned out, uh, there existed these massive, massive data sets that were already uh, annotated, that is to say, uh, somebody went through and clicked on all of those, all of these key points, all these little landmarks for all the people and all in, in these hundreds of thousands of images. 
at great expense to a bunch of tech companies that can pay crowdsourcers to do it. And it's an amazing data set and all the methods are being developed basically testing against this, these data sets. But the issue was that in a lab setting, when we're not studying uh, humans in their, in their typical you know, uh, environments, we're, we're going to have images that look like this. And so anytime we have any animal species in the setting, anything, uh, different cameras and so on, we're going to have exactly zero labeled images because these images look nothing like those that are already existing the, the human data set. So for, you know, even when these methods came out, the general consensus was, was that they're just simply not relevant to the study of, of biology or behavior because, quite simply, it would not be feasible for anyone to come in and actually label this many images uh, in, anytime you have a new animal. So we set out to solve this problem. And the solution we came up with we wrapped around into a method called LEAP. LEAP stands for LEAP Estimates Animal Pose. He refers to that acronym by my former uh, undergraduate mentee, David Lodorondo. Uh, and the way that LEAP works was pretty similar to how those methods for the human pose estimation. That is to say that it takes an uh, image as input of your favorite animal, it feeds it into a convolutional neural network, which then learns to predict these, that confidence map representation we talked about. Was to predict the likelihood that each body part is located in the image. But our key intuition here was that if we designed a, a convolutional neural network sufficiently lightweight that we could modify and adjust to work with a lot less data by having a lot fewer parameters that it needs to learn and those intermediate transformations that it needs to do, then it would also just require a lot less data. And we tested it out. It indeed turned out to be true, where uh, even with as few as 10 labeled images, uh, even though we still had a good amount of error, here the outer circles correspond to where 90% of the predictions fall relative to the ground truth. You can see that for a lot of the body points, it was actually doing a pretty reasonable job, at least 90% you know, of the time or so. But that time that we got to around 250 labeled images, it was getting basically perfect predictions. Right, it's a, it's it essentially we're getting it down to a level of roughly what the, you know, the variability between two humans trying to click on the same point, and this is all at you know essentially a thousand fold fewer uh, labeled images than was required for the, the human pose estimation models. What we found was that not only could we do this more practically in the sense that we required a lot less data, but because the neural networks were also small, we could run on a computer rather than the massive you know, compute cluster like you might find at Google, it meant that you could also enable what's called, called human in the loop link, which is essentially where you could train in just a few minutes, you train the, the, the neural networks for just a few minutes, and then have them guess where all the body parts are, which you could then just correct. And this process drastically reduced the, the amount of time that it would take to label these frames, to the point where initially it would take around two minutes to label each frame, and by the time that, you know, every time that we train, the neural network would get more and more accurate. So there would be fewer and fewer errors for us to correct. So by the time that we got to the end of this process, it was only taking around 10 seconds to label each frame. Again, making this whole process a lot more practical and uh, accelerating. And of course, you saw lots of images there of fruit flies. That's what uh, we said in my, in my grad lab. But it, it, we immediately saw that it was going to be applicable to pretty much everything. And so, uh, folks are picking it up and using it for all sorts of different uh, species and settings. Okay, so all that was about getting into how do we use AI to study uh, uh, one form of biological motion, which is basically to step down that one level, right? Down to be able to track a bunch of individual body parts. But like I said, social behavior really was one class of behaviors that was very near and dear to my heart. Let's restart this guy. Um, essentially, this is a setting in which, uh, you know, we now have a lot of interacting animals, a lot of body parts flying around, everybody's trying to touch each other all the time. That's really where the exciting stuff happens in social behavior. And all this introduces a bunch of challenges. Uh, which includes, you know, while extending 
are based methods that could detect all these individual body parts uh, to work with multiple animals was as okay in terms of the, the you know basically finding multiple let's say you know, noses and, and necks and paws. We were then left with a couple of much harder problems. One is that of part grouping, that is to say, should we find a bunch of noses and tails? How do we know which nose and what goes with which tail, right? And this now requires reasoning, not just about what a tail looks like or what a nose looks like, but really what a whole body looks like. Because in order to know which head goes with which tail, you really need to know about the, the notion of morphology. So that ends up, ended up being like a much more difficult high level problem than just detecting landmarks. And then the next one, which is exceptionally challenging, is that of identity assignment. Just to say, assuming we've done all of this within a single image, how do we know which animal is which across multiple frames in time? And now we're not just reasoning about individual body parts or about individual uh, bodies, but really about uh, what a notion of an animal is, what a notion of an identity is. What makes an animal the same animal as the one that you saw a second ago? And as you can tell, like we're really stepping up in, in the levels of, of difficulty here. And ultimately, what we found was that there wasn't really a single solution that is one size fits all. And so recognizing that, that complexity, uh, what we did was to develop the successor of LEAP that we call SLEEP, or social LEAP, as the maintainer proposes. And SLEEP really has, has taken off and become the flagship of, of my lab because we really designed it as a general purpose framework for the entire you know, uh, multi-animal post-tracking workflow. And then as we came to learn, has applications way beyond that. But essentially, it takes you from having raw videos through to annotation, to training the neural networks, then pulling in your data for, for further correction and inspection. But in other words, in Marshall, the power of deep learning, this, this uh, you know, leading form of AI, to take images of our animals and predict any number of body parts and any body configuration in any sort of setting with any number of animals. So here's roughly what that looks like in, in about 60 seconds, just because I want to give you a very clear idea of, you know, of what this looks like in practice. So we can pull in a video into this desktop interface. You don't need to do any coding to use it. This was a big part of what our goal we wanted to achieve here. This is a tool for biologists. Biologists should need to learn how to do AI in order to, to use it. So you can see that essentially the way you, you, you operate within it is basically by defining the body parts that you want to track and then just clicking and dragging to the correct location of where you want those body parts to be positioned. And you do that in a handful of images before you're ready to essentially just train the neural network, which again, you can do entirely from the user interface here. It'll show you in real time what it looks like as the neural network learns to predict those body parts because it's opening those part confidence maps which is essentially how it's thinking about where the body parts are. And then we import the predictions back in, which we can just double click to correct if the network is making any mistakes. And you can go through that process for a couple of rounds until the, the network learns to predict exactly what it is that you want to track in your images, and then, and which then you'll, you'll, you'll basically then use to track continuously across time a whole bunch of frames where now you can see that we can keep track of the identities and the body parts, you know, where again, here I've only labeled something like you know, 10 or 20 images. Great. So that's roughly how the core workflow looks like. And I just wanted to show you that in particular, just so that you have a, a clear visual that there's nothing that crazy or magic happening uh, you know, in practice when you're using this thing. Yes, there's a lot of math and a lot of, lots of uh, algorithmic work that goes under the hood, but Really, our main emphasis was to, uh, in, in developing sleep from the ground up, was to create a industry-grade you know, software framework for enabling the use of this technology. We did not feel like our job was done once we developed the algorithms, but rather only when we can make them use, usable and useful for, for practitioners. And while we put a lot of work to developing sleep as a system, and it has lots of modules, and it has all sorts of bells and whistles to make it work uh, reliably, 
and to uh, really serve the purpose of it being a, a scientific software that is you know, reproducible, uh, that you can kind of uh, configure in a way that allows you to get the same results over and over. Um, it, the, the, all of this space that culminates in um, you know, higher accessibility, essentially ensuring that other folks can use it. And we've had everyone from uh, you know, middle schoolers to the much more challenging uh, <laughs> user, user base of faculty to even be able to learn how to how use sleep basically within minutes, right? It's a, we really attempted to, to push towards this uh, idea that you know, AI should be accessible and that it's not the responsibility of, uh, of the end user to come in with all the necessary background that not everyone might have the opportunity to learn, for example, how to code or even more advanced how to do machine learning. We don't believe that that, that should be, that the onus should be on the, on the end users because at the end of the day, that attitude really only serves to, um, uh, uh, you know, to decrease equitable access to what is really like a very a very useful technology. And so we apply this model to basically all the products that we develop in our lab. And as you can see from lots of our stats here that we have, you know, a really, really rapidly growing user base with lots of folks, um, uh, you know, interacting with us from all over the world, asking for asking for help or sharing their results and, uh, and certainly uh, filling my inbox up to the the point of uh, uh, intractability, but we, we appreciate it. Um, so here's a, a, a short little gallery. Once again, of the, you know, the broad you know, kinds of conditions in which we were developing sleep, but as you'll see, I think in a moment, really it's something that ends up being applicable for all sorts of different settings and use cases. Uh, cool. So, before I, 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 super, I super jump into this, this next step here, I just want to you know, recently pause and let us digest for a second and see if there's any absolutely burning questions. Otherwise, what we're going to talk about next is essentially tell you just a little bit about how we solve a couple of those problems algorithmically, just to build a little, little bit of an intuition for how we go about uh, addressing these kinds of problems algorithmically from a very high level. Okay, so as I mentioned, sleep has many, many modules, many little pieces that achieve different aspects of the whole AI workflow. And I'll just mention one of them for now, which is that of how we solve those problems that pertain to uh, uh, Harvard, right? In other words, figuring out which head goes with which tail. So as I said, diversity was key here, we needed multiple methods because they were better in different settings. And so in one of them, the idea was to first find our animals and then detect their individual body parts. The way that worked was that we take an image of our animal, put it in through a neural network, and learn to predict a center points on, on those animals, essentially something like that, centroid representation. And we can use that to crop uh, a sort of zoomed in version of these images focused on each of the animals, but then we can feed into a second neural network that then learns to predict those confidence maps. But the key thing here is that it learns to predict the confidence maps only for the centered animal, even if, like you can see there in some of, the, in some of these frames, even if there are multiple heads present in the frame, it has to learn to predict only the head for the centered animal. In other words, it is solving that part grouping problem implicitly by essentially learning to reason about the relative geometry of a body relative to where it is inside the image. Meanwhile, in our second approach, uh, what uh, we implemented was an, a, a method in which we, we could detect that we could group the body parts from the bottom up, which is to say, Rather than finding the animals and detecting their body parts, instead we detect their body parts and then group them into the animals. And the way that that works is by taking our image of our animal, feeding it in through our neural network, which then learns to predict the locations of those body parts, as well as, and this is for all animals, as well as a representation of the connectivity between the body parts. 
So recall that when I talked about the fact that we need to be able to reason about the entire body of the animal. Uh, you know, in the, in the previous case, we did it implicitly. Here, we're doing it very much explicitly or very or directly asking the neural network to predict not only the locations of the body parts, but really how they're connected, which therefore requires them to reason about, you know, uh, uh, the relationships between different parts of the body. In doing so, we then can come up with a, a, a metric that allows us to quantify how likely is it that two body parts are connected, from which we can then derive an algorithm that can figure out how to connect those body parts, how to match them up so that they belong to the same animal. And that works pretty well in, in lots of cases where uh, the models can benefit, the AI can benefit from ex more explicitly reasoning about the body parts. Okay. I'll mention one more little vignette here uh, about uh, some of the underlying work that we did here. And again, I'll emphasize the fact that really each one of these boxes all have their individual stories since we really did put a lot of work and attention into um, essentially every part of the work. But one of them was all the engineering work that we did to optimize the performance of this uh, these new networks. And without getting to too much of the nitty gritty details, suffice it to say that uh, we put together a few different technologies that can take advantage of the fact that these things can run on specialized hardware called GPUs or graphics processing units to uh, minimize the latency uh, with which we can predict uh, poses of multiple animals, all the way down to the point where we could do it in just a few milliseconds. And what that enabled is uh, a type of experiment that we like to call social mind control. And that's a bit of a tongue in cheek name to really refer to it's also known as closed loop, uh, uh, a closed loop experiment. This is one in which here we have two fruit flies engaged in courtship. Uh, the blue is the male fly, uh, red is the female fly. And by experimental design, they would normally start copulating once the male uh, 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 does a courtship approach towards her. But because we can detect that approach in real time, we can also then essentially turn on a light that will optogenetically activate a set of neurons in the female fly brain that essentially will force her to reject him. In other words, we're detecting the social behavior of one animal, and we're using that to control the social behavior response of another animal. And in doing so, that allows us to kind of patch into that, that, that closed loop of uh, uh, you know, social interaction in which the animals exchange all these sensory cues that guide their next actions. So by, by breaking that and forcing an unusual or you know, uh, uh, an unlikely action to happen, we can see how the other animal responds. Okay, cool. Um, in terms of where we're kind of going next with this, one of the, the new directions that we're taking is, is to do this in 3D. This is in collaboration with uh, at Eric Faulkner's lab at Princeton, where the idea is to leverage multiple uh, viewpoints. Here you can see we have uh, eight different cameras at all different angles, which we're then going to use to essentially triangulate the locations of each one of those body parts so that then we can reconstruct all of these landmarks, all these, all these coordinates in three dimensions. And what that allows us to do is to basically, you know, be less susceptible to some of the tracking errors that we would have when we're looking at animals in 2D, sometimes they're just on top of each other, sometimes we just can't see a particular body part, as well as just get more information overall about the geometry of their movements and their, their especially when they're interacting closely. Um, and in terms of where, what kind of thing we can do with that, well, in one, one ongoing project that we have in collaboration with the LA County Museum of Art and from Albright, Sir Jefferson here at Salt, uh, we're able to do this with a set of museum visitors in a, in a naturalistic space, if you will, where then we're able to reconstruct the locations of all the body parts of, of all the museum exhibit goers and 
since we know, we, we've now reconstructed, uh, partially reconstructed the environment inside of this museum exhibit, we can then essentially predict from, based on the head uh, location and orientation, what the museum exhibit looks like be seeing so that we can then develop models that describe human behavior in a setting in which they have all of these computing, uh, computing sensory cues that would uh, guide the next behavior. In other words, are people drawn more about certain visual properties of the art, or are they just going to go with their group if they indeed are coming with a group? So that concludes this first section here. I think we're about just over yeah, uh, halfway through here. Uh, so if there's no questions, I think I'm going to go ahead and just jump into our next section, which is one of our uh, major application areas, which we've been using this AI technology to learn new biology, that of essentially the progression of diseases. And so one very natural thing that we can do with this approach is to basically just scale it up, right? The idea is that uh, uh, collaboration with lots of other folks here. So we're building out this, this system where we can essentially monitor many mice uh, at the same time in their home cage, in their environment where they, they live the entire time. And this is the idea is that we can then apply the, you know, apply sleep to it, get all the poses out. And from that, infer all these different quantitative phenotypes that might correspond to different kinds of disease models. And so think of these as behavioral models. Essentially, all the little you know, ticks or gates or tremors and things that will correspond to the progression of the disease, as all diseases, all nature diseases really tend to be multi systemic. They affect all parts of your body and how you, how you uh, utilize them. And so, by tracking this over time, we can essentially get a really high dimensional, really uh, informative signal, quantitative signal of what happens as the disease progresses and as these, these symptoms begin to emerge. And what's left is to kind of figure out a way to make sense of it, right? One of the, the things that we can do, this videos operate with this, is to essentially, um, uh, you know, uh, quantify the interactions between the animals and the environment, how, how often are they feeding, how often are they drinking, how often are they interacting with Another, or often are they, for example, uh, climbing around on different objects in this environment where, uh, you know, if they, for example, are experiencing pain or other forms of you know, uh, symptoms that correspond to disease, they're going to be less likely to be able to climb on things and essentially form these kind of play behaviors. But at the end of the day, right? This, this is a visualization of a very, very small subset of this of our first pilot data set, which, as you can see, has lots of patterns. There's a lot of information in here. There's lots of blocky patterns, lots of things oscillating, but it, it's a lot to keep track of because we're really we're recording these guys 24 hours a day at, at a high frame rate, and that ends up just being you know, billions and billions of data points. So one way to make sense of it is to use another form of AI called unsupervised machine learning. And we do this in collaboration with our, uh, with our friends at, at Harvard and Stanford who have uh, developed a, a probabilistic method that can do what's called motion sequencing. Uh, what it essentially does is it takes the sleep-based pose tracking and tries to infer what kinds of discrete structure we can find in that. And what I mean by that is we think of behavior as body language, all this, 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 uh, this movement patterns as body language, then uh, syllables would be chunks in time in which the body is moving in the same way. And so we use this method and apply it to our ALS data set. This is a preclinical model of initial lateral sclerosis where we really just want to understand for this particular uh, degenerative disease, how, how soon can we detect when these animals are developing symptoms of the disease? And so in one of our first pass analyses, the very first thing that we did was just to ask, how does the distribution of syllables that these animals uh, use change from the late stage of the disease relative to the early stage? 
And so what we can find are essentially all of these syllables. These are all uh, types of behaviors that are just discovered by the, this AI, this machine learning method, purely based on the statistics of the data. And when we look at a few of these, we can find the ones that, that whose uh, uh, frequency of occurrence change the most over time, over disease progression. And so if we look at just one of them, that corresponds to something that the animals do, do less, and it totally checks out. It's this climbing behavior, right? It less them as a, a neuron a degenerative disease that essentially leads to the loss of motor function. So as the animals lose the ability to coordinate their body, they're going to lose their ability to essentially be able to climb. So it makes sense that this is why that begins to happen less over time. And we can essentially do this for, for all sorts of behaviors. I mean, really, this is done in, in an unsupervised fashion, which is to say we never tell the algorithm what each behavior is. Instead, it just discovers it from the statistics of the data. And by doing so, we can essentially leverage the richness of description of body movement and body language to, to pull out all of this highly meaningful, high-level structure that corresponds to uh, all the movements that might be associated with disease. In other words, we're not pulling the animals out of their, of their home cage and trying to get them to learn how to press some levers or how to balance on a beam or how to navigate a maze. We're just going to look at their natural body language, fully unperturbed, and in doing so, using this combination of different AI technologies, uh, learn the entire, how to predict the entire behavioral repertoire of the animals, with which we can then, uh, which, which we can then leverage to predict the entire profile of behavioral biomarkers that correspond to the progression of this disease. So you can you can imagine how, uh, at one point in the future, this could be translated into a clinical setting in which you could effectively point a camera, potentially even just a phone camera, at someone, analyze their body language, and based on how their body language patterns change over time, predict the, the likelihood that they might be developing a disease. One of the, the other directions that we're taking this is up, essentially. <laughs> so in collaboration with some folks at, uh, at NASA, we're now adopting, we're adapting this approach to work with the videos of mice in space, the exact same objective. We want to try to discover biomarkers uh, in animal studies that have been conducted in, in low Earth orbits, in the International Space Station, and uh, we've developed a technology that we would need to begin to understand the biology of space, uh, uh, space travel. Um, Ultimately, we want to be able to use this not only to understand how uh, you know, extended periods of time and space changes your, your fundamental biology, but also to be able to detect when the occurrence of diseases might be, might be happening. Where, after all, once we start sending humans to uh, distant destinations like Mars, it would be very helpful if we could have something that can constantly keep track of their health to make sure that they get the treatment that they need before it becomes catastrophic in their you know, eight months away from Earth in any kind of medical care. All right. In the last few minutes here, I want to talk about uh, one other project that, that uh, we have ongoing in the lab, which is to apply all the same technology to, to plants. And in particular, this emerged when uh, at the completion of a little collaboration with some folks who were using sleep to uh, study movement of plants. And so have some plants around you, you might be staring at them and thinking, no, they're definitely not moving. Well, yes, this is obviously very much sped up. These are all time lapse images that were captured over, over many hours or days. And the idea here was to leverage sleep to capture all these different movements. You can see now, it doesn't really correspond to a skeleton or exoskeleton, but really just landmarks of interest along the morphology of these plants, uh, roots, shoots, and tracking how they move over, uh, over time and throughout the day. And in doing so, they're able to characterize the dynamics that, uh, that govern how plants move towards light, towards nutrients, and so forth. Once I started my lab here at Salk, uh, we, we joined the uh, Harnessing Plants Initiative. 
this is an effort to combat climate change by bioengineering plants or selecting and screening for natural variants of plants that have several properties that are going to benefit uh, the, the climate by essentially getting plants, particularly crop plants, that have deeper roots or massive roots, the roots that produce more carbon-rich uh, uh, molecules that altogether essentially transform regular plants into one that is now a machine for pulling down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sticking it into the soil, effectively sequestering it and preventing it from contributing to uh, the greenhouse effects and, and global warming. And what's particularly elegant about this effort is that uh, agriculture provides a natural, uh, scalable solution to tackling this, this problem, where we just you know, uh, get the seeds that correspond to plants that do more carbon sequestration. It's easy to then just send them out everywhere and plant them all over the place, such that now we have uh, a very easy way to increase the carbon sequestration capabilities of different plants. So while there are amazing geneticists and plant biologists here at Salk who uh, really understand deeply the processes that lead to a, a deeper root formation and growth, what they're missing was a good way to do phenotyping, right? In other words, to, to take images that might look like this on the left, here we have a cylindrical planter, and predict whether or not they're going to have more roots, even just measure, quantify how much uh, root development they have. And this is what's called as, as sort of the, the features uh, with which we can use to predict these, this outcome is what's called a root system architecture phenotyping. And in collaboration with Wolfgang Bush's lab here at SALT, we've really been doing a lot of work in developing pipelines that can track all of the roots of these, uh, of these uh, a whole bunch of different plants and pull out different traits that correspond to uh, everything from you know, how many roots to how deep distributions, their angles, their, their, their curviness, and all sorts of properties that then correspond to the underlying biology that led to their development. And from there, we can use more machine learning to then predict how they're gonna turn out in terms of their carbon sequestration capabilities. And so what, what we've uh, been doing is developing this open source pipeline that can leverage sleep to then uh, detect all the, all the locations of all the routes and then uh, pull out all these different kinds of traits about the network and, and architecture of these routes. Uh, we've tested it out on a whole bunch of different plant species, which as you can see have very different you know, properties about the root system architecture. Uh, we show that it, it works just as well as, as what uh, humans can produce and works much uh, much faster and more efficiently than existing methods that use you know, alternative types of algorithms that are more error prone and, and, and lead to other issues. Um, and finally, we show that we can use this method to basically map out the whole space of root system architectures. We can almost sort them. You see this sort of gradient here that corresponds to the a, a property of their convex hole, or essentially how spread out they are uh, as, some, as one of the main determinants that describes the, the space of, 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 of phenotypic structure of these, uh, of these plants. Uh, essentially allowing us to put all our plants into a, a 2D graph, into a, a map uh, in which their, their actual architecture defines the, defines the space and boundaries. Okay, so that was this last section here on plant phenotyping and how we use it to uh, understand the biology of their root system development and how we use that to combat climate change. And uh, with that, I just want to thank all the amazing folks in the lab, all our amazing collaborators, uh, lots of cool people who made this, this work possible, and our, our funding sources and, uh, that, that really, really made this, this, all of these endeavors uh, practical as well as thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about our work. And with that, uh, thank you and I'm happy to take any questions or really discuss anything at a broader level.
topics. Great. Thank you, Tim. Well, the, this, that was fascinating and, and everything from mice to plants to um, museum visitors. Um, I, I'll start before I kind of uh, head into to the other questions. You know, as you're talking about climate change, I, when I, I don't do anything like you do, but um, when I think of using AI and machine learning, uh, there's the energy cost. And in Utah, most of our computing power is coal powered electricity. Um, what are the current kind of, I don't know, cutting edge methods to reduce our energy reliance using AI? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's especially a timely one given the emergence of generative AI and these large language models like ChatGPT that have emerged over the past you know, year or two. Um, it's a tough question, but one of the things that enables that to, um, I think, happen in a more climate-friendly way is the fact that we can distribute a lot of this computing power all around the world. And a lot of technology has been built, and I think especially over the last mm. few years, to allow you to very transparently be able to, to do the kinds of you know, heavy-duty computing you need to do um, all over the world through, through the cloud, right? There's mm. different cloud providers that are not really specializing on in, in precisely that. And so if you don't want to rely on your local power source, which might not be as green as as what you can use in other places, you can essentially rent out these guys from different places. But I will say that overall in the AI community, I think this is a problem that is being um, acknowledged and, and, and grappled with more and more. Um, in particular, as some machine learning conferences now require that you would try to estimate how much you know, carbon might have been expended mm -hmm. in, in the, over the course of your study. And I think there are these kinds of initiatives are crucial for really enforcing the idea that it's you know, we can't just make all these developments, make all uh, you know, develop all these technologies in a vacuum, right? It happens in our right. our planet that you can't ignore the costs that you know uh, uh, affect everyone else. Yeah, thank you. Uh, other questions? Um, I had a question. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, and especially how you thought about different challenges, like different ways to track individual animals. Um, but I had a question about like when you switched from looking at animal morphologies to plants, because the animals, I mean, you kind of know that like each mouse, I mean, most mice have four legs, right? And <laughs> one tail and one head. But if you're looking at roots, like you could have any number of roots and they can break, like branch off in different ways. So like what kind of shifts in your thinking did you have to do to set up an algorithm that could recognize different morphologies within um, life form structures? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, that's one that we definitely, um, uh, you know, punted on when we initially developed these algorithms because, yeah, we were looking at, at flies and mice and mostly ones that have the same number of limbs, as you pointed out. Um, but we always think that there's going to be use cases for these. Uh, and it goes beyond plants. I think one of the other top use cases that, that we hear about uh, is, is cephalopods and, and worms. Uh, those also have pretty, pretty you know, non-linear, non-skeletally you know, constrained uh, morphologies where you know, it's really hard for you to, you know, as a human, look at a, an, like a random frame in a video of an octopus and be able to click on the exact same tentacle, the tip, even the tip of the same tentacle consistently across time because they're going to be all, all, all over the place and inter, interweaving, intertwining each other. Um, the approach that we've taken, in particular for the plants, and this is the work well of it, also in these other settings, is to basically uh, break this down to two problems. One is this idea that we have sort of non-linear, non-rigid uh, parts of the morphology, uh, which we essentially tackle by defining a, a, a skeleton. This is what we call it, but in practice it's just a, a, a collection of landmarks. We then define one that just has as many points as you want along the morphology. 
And the rule of thumb is that you just want to space them out so that they're equally spaced. And this gives enough context for the AI to understand that even though there's no like, you know, elbow corner in like the, when well, you're like three quarters of the way along the plant route, that because the previous landmark was some fixed distance away, the next one should be some fixed distance away, that it kind of learn from that context. But ultimately it's just learning from your own protocol that you're going to develop for annotation. We run into the same problem incidentally in mice, also when it comes to their tails. Sure, that's <laughs> notoriously difficult to track. But the second issue is that of repeated morphology. And that's one where it turns out that the, the, the issue that we solve for dealing with multiple animals have the exact same uh, solution here. We can effectively treat multiple parts of the body as equivalent to just multiple instances of, of the same set of landmarks that we want to try. And in that way, we, we, we solve the problem just by, you know, even though they're part of the same animal or same you know, organism, we, we treat them as separate ones and then we connect them afterwards. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I had a question as well. Um, super interesting talk, lots of uh, very cool angles with this. Um, I wanted to ask about the plant, uh, yeah, making them better carbon stores, which I think is a really cool idea. And I guess like if this was used as like a practical solution, right, you would, you think you would grow like large um, amounts of like these plants, they can take um, CO2 out of the atmosphere. I guess how, do you have any thoughts on how you would balance doing something like that with also, right, this idea of as humans, we've kind of destroyed like the natural diversity that is there in plants. And so like, this is like a really fascinating idea, but also, also there's like this disconnect between um, doing things to decrease emissions and also like conservation sometimes. So I was just wondering if um, you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, a hundred percent. I feel like this is another reason why I like this idea of really targeting agriculture and not just arbitrary plant species, right? I think it would be terrible if we start like bulldozing the Amazon and replacing it with trees with deeper roots and having like a monoculture type situation. That would be, you know, maybe we'll solve the carbon problem, but immediately we get into a biodiversity problem, right? Now, because uh, industrial agriculture has it, the damage already done there. There's not there's not that much that that changes when we just swap out one, you know, uh, you know virtually genetically identical set of plants with another genetically identical set of plants that at least just do more carbon capture. Uh, this can, you know, it does nothing to improve biodiversity, but at least it mitigates the potential harms of of, of increasing this. Ideally, and I think there's been a lot of like uh, calculations done by the other folks in this initiative, if you can deploy this out to even like a, a modest fraction of the world agricultural um, uh, systems, we'll still be able to get to a global net uh, neutral carbon uh, pretty relatively quickly. Like we wouldn't even need to convert every farm into, into ones that, that do this, so long as we can actually get plants that uh, can sequester enough carbon. And we're already well on the way. But should that fail, because I think that the economics of it will interact with policy, and as we know, our, our government is not the most conducive always to certain climate-friendly policies. Um, other solutions will be essentially, you know, where in some places they'll create, you know, carbon credit economies. Um, you don't have to necessarily do this with, with crop plants that you're going to produce things that maybe you, know, you don't want to do it if you didn't think it's going to hurt the yield. Well, it turns out that you also do this with like cover crops, crops that would never be you know, sold in the market anyways, but that we can leverage during the off seasons to still do carbon capture through carbon sequestration at no harm to anyone else, right? It's any, any kind of like, think of it local economies. Thank you for that really thoughtful answer. Well, thanks again, Tamil, and um, those are great questions uh, and thoughts, things to think through for us. Um, and and uh, I, I, 
don't think I think Kiki's gone, but um, yeah, th thank you uh, for for presenting this fascinating work to us, and um, uh, I think we're we're done. Uh, but it, it, are we free, free to contact you if we have any questions in the future? Thank you. Feel free to reach out. Uh, it's not always all. Okay. If you don't get any answer, please email me multiple times. I, Great. I'd love to love to chat with you guys. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.